All right, this morning uh, for our sermon time, we are continuing in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have a Bible, uh, in a moment we will read our passage this morning. Uh, This morning we're going to talk about living as obedient children. Um, Church I pastored before we we came to Ringgold in Indiana, we had a member, and I've talked about her before, I I share her testimony from time to time. Her name was uh, Joanne Walker, but everybody called her Aunt Jo. Um, she was a wonderful church member. She was faithful. She was there all the time. She was encouraging. She was a worker. She was funny. She had a great sense of humor. Aunt Jo was in her 80s, and everybody just called her Aunt Jo. Um, she was there Wednesday nights every week. She came and she helped to cook for our, our midweek meal that we served at our Bible study. Um, she single-handedly sent everybody a birthday card or anniversary card in the church on their birthday and anniversary. She was in her 80s, but she was on our mission committee and helped organize. We took two trips to the Appalachian Mountains to a place called Buckhead, Kentucky. She went with us. She did whatever we were doing on those mission trips. And what was really amazing, uh, also I I didn't mention she she was widowed. She had a son in his 40s who had developmental issues, so she cared for him single-handedly. And she did that with a a wisdom and a grace and a peace that were just a blessing. Um, What was really amazing about Aunt Jo was she said if I had met her 20 or 30 years before, that that she was a different person. And I remember asking her, well, tell me about it. She said, well, before I got saved, I was just a miserable person. She said, I cursed like a sailor all the time. She said, if you saw me, I normally would have had a beer in this hand, a cigarette in the other hand. And she said, I was mean. I was just a, a, was not a nice person. She said, but it all began to change when she came to Christ, uh, that she got saved and those things just kind of God whittled them away, took them away. And uh, the change was so powerful that I just couldn't, if you, maybe you've experienced this, I couldn't imagine the, the Aunt Jo she was describing. And I used to kind of joke around and I would tell her, well, you know, that, that was the old Aunt Jo, and she died. I said, so I've only known the born-again Aunt Jo, the new one. And that's exactly what it was. She was a different person. Uh, for some of us today, if, if you're a Christian, some of you have had this kind of change in your life. Uh, you are a, literally a different person visibly and to everyone that knows you than you were. For some of us, the change is more gradual, isn't it? I would say the more common testimony is we come to faith and we're stubborn and it takes God a while, right? The old habits die hard. Uh, It's not an overnight transformation. It's a little bit more like how, you know, it happens so slowly. I look in the mirror and this is, I know this is vain and silly, but I look in the mirror and think, you know, I'm doing okay for my mid-50s. I look about the same, but man, I look at my kids that graduated from high school with, they look like old people. And then I, I realize I, I, this only is because I see myself every day. If they saw me, they'd say, oh, are you Eric's dad? You know, I haven't seen you in a long time or something like that. But for most of us, the change is gradual. But either way, we're going to see today that in First Peter, the point is that whether it's drastic and sudden or long-term and slow but still very significant, all of us should be experiencing a transformation of who we are. And today we're going to look at this in First Peter, and he calls this learning to live as obedient children. If I were to ask this morning, how many of you who are Christians live in complete obedience to God your Father? Let's see your hands. Okay, I saw two or four or five or six. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody raised their hand. Those of you up front, you're wondering, who raised their hand? You, you can't say yes. So we all acknowledge we have not yet arrived at being completely obedient children. So let's hear from God's Word today, and hopefully this will encourage us. God will encourage us by His Word and His Spirit. No matter how old we are, no matter how many children of our own we have so that we don't even think of ourselves as children anymore, maybe God can help us to understand anew. We've been born again. We are now His children, and we are called to live as obedient children. 
So this morning, to think about this, we're going to read 1 Peter 1, 13 to 25. Beginning in verse 13, this is God's word, so let's listen. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Amen. Father, we ask you to bless our hearing and doing of your word this morning. As we have talked about in the last few weeks, um, Peter has in the previous verses gone into great detail to celebrate and explain and sort of unfold the wonder and the glory of the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. He just talked about how God chose us how God caused us to be born again. And I want you to hear that phrase has been used several times just in the first chapter of First Peter, being born again to a living hope through Christ. Peter has talked about how our temporary trials that we face are going to pale in comparison to the glory of the salvation that is to be revealed and, and uh, fulfilled in its final and full completion in heaven. And so now Peter begins to shift a little bit from explaining and and magnifying God for the salvation we have to instructing us on how we should therefore live. He says we are to live with our minds fixed on this salvation. So he's, he's explained it to us. He says, now, always keep your hope in what God's going to do for you. In other words, live in anticipation all the time of your salvation that is at work right now and that will be fulfilled at that last day. And Peter says that we are to live as obedient children to our Heavenly Father. In verse 14, he says, Live as obedient children and do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Peter is reminding us of what he's already mentioned in verse 3, that God has caused us, if we are believers, to be born again. We've mentioned that phrase. It's really important because as we talk about God as our Father, we have to understand what has happened so that we can call Him Father. See, before a person believes in Jesus Christ, places their faith, their life in His hands, the Bible says that our sin, and and the Bible says that all of us sin, every person sins and falls short of the glory, that that sin causes a break and we are alienated from God. So a person that is not a a Christian 
is, cannot call God as Father. They can call on Him as Creator. They can call on Him as God. They can call on Him as the only God, something like that. But they can't call Him Father yet because they are not His children. They are, in fact, the Bible says, enemies by our doing, not God's. We have made ourselves God's enemies. And see, this is why Jesus told a man like Nicodemus who was talking to him about how does a person enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, unless one is what? You know it. Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. A new birth, according to Jesus, one that he goes on to tell Nicodemus, he describes it as being born of spirit, right? This is required for us to be reconciled to God, to be not enemies anymore, but rather to become his children. And Jesus explained to Nicodemus, he didn't understand it. He said, how can a man be born a second time? He cannot go back into his mother's womb. And Jesus had to clarify, he was not talking about being born spiritually again, but being born of spirit, a spiritual birth that needs to happen. And it is just as real as our physical birth that we've all experienced. And when that happens, according to the Bible, an amazing thing occurs. When a person through faith is born again, they are adopted. Amen. Yes, this is an amazing thing. That term adoption is used in the Bible a bunch of times to describe our relationship with God who is in heaven. It's used in Romans, it's used in Galatians, it's used in Ephesians to describe what God has done to us to make, his, to make us his sons and his daughters. In Romans 8.15, Paul says, you have received the Spirit. Now there's that born of the Spirit thing. When we believe, we are born again. And Paul says, you've now received the Spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. That word Abba, you've probably heard. It is a familiar term. It is a fam familial term. It's the term a child would use of their father that wouldn't be used by someone else. Some people will say, Daddy, I had a good friend that he loved the Lord. He called God Papa when he prayed because he said, that's my, my way I say Abba, Father. But notice this. We just see the whole picture here. We become born again by God's Spirit through faith when we do, we receive the Spirit that now we can call God what? Father, right? So you may not think of yourself as adopted, but you are, every single one of us. Now, I love this because adoption is an amazing thing. And it's an amazing concept to apply to our relationship with God. Now, I'll tell you, I have met a lot of people in my life, both as a minister and even just before I was ever in ministry, People whose greatest hurt in their life, their deepest wound, was feeling unloved or unwanted by their parents. Now, I'm not talking about adopted people. I'm talking about biological children. Um, I have one friend whose story is just heartbreaking. She it told me one time how she was born after her mother tried to abort her unsuccessfully. And after she was born, she was just as unwanted by her mother all of her life as she had been before she was born. Um, but I'll tell you something. I have never, not once, heard of an unwanted adoption or an unplanned adoption, right? It doesn't exist. See, this, this term adoption shows us how God wanted us to be his children, how God pursued us to make us his children, how God has paid the price because, you know, adopting is expensive, and it was certainly so for the Lord. He has paid the price, and he loves us now as his own, as his adopted children that he chose, that he wanted, that he loves. According to Peter, since God has loved us, since God has chosen us, since God has paid the price to adopt us, we therefore should do something in return. And that is that we should live as obedient children. Now, one of the ways we do that, so we might think about what does it mean to live as an obedient child to God? Well, one of the ways we do that is we try to be like our Father in heaven. 
like father, like son, you've heard the saying, or like father, like daughter, this would apply, applies to all of us. Now, one of the things that makes parents really proud, and if you're a, a kid and your parents are still living, understand this, one of the ways you can delight your parents is to see something good in them and try to imitate it. Parents, you ever had your kids do that? Right? Um, you know, you hear them say something that they've heard you said. Uh, you hear them hold some conviction or belief that you hold dear and you hear them and see them embracing it. That makes you proud. Uh, the problem for us as humans is uh, they don't always just imitate the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> I remember one time, uh, one sweet memory was we were on vacation. We were in a hotel, and James and Ellie were young. And we have a video of them. They got in the pool, and they started playing baptizing. And, and James was like dunking Ellie in the water, kind of reciting the stuff he's heard me say when I baptize. I was like, that, that just makes my heart happy, right? But the problem with, with human parents is that our kids oftentimes imitate our bad things, too. Uh, when you hear some five-year-old bust out with a cuss word, what's the thing you always think in your mind? Well, I wouldn't have really heard that. Right? You start looking at their parents skeptically. Um, whether it's our profanities or our anxieties, our insecurities, our vanities, our kids will receive from us, their earthly parents, the, the good and the bad. But isn't it wonderful that in imitating our Father, remember Peter said, be holy as He is holy. In other words, be like your Father. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to worry that there's any bad in Him? We we are free to 100% with all that we have try to be like our Heavenly Father. And if we will, we cannot go wrong because He is perfect. There is no sin, there is no anxiety, there is no insecurity, there is no profanity, there is no vanity, there is nothing in Him but what is good. So it is both for His glory and our good that we say, God, I'm going to try to be like you, my Father. Ask Him to help you do that. That's one of the things the Bible describes that happens to us that is amazing, that God is at work in every Christian's life conforming you into the image of His Son. Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. God's working on it. Ask Him to show you how and to help you to do your part. Now, Peter goes on to say that, of course, we are adopted and God is our Father, but our God is holy and perfect in every way, right? Be holy as he is, as he is holy, and he is also perfectly just. And so Peter says, now, as you imitate your father, understand that your father is also the judge. Your father is the one who's going to judge everyone impartially. So Peter says, we love him, he's our father, but we also respect him. We revere him. He uses that Bible word fear that is kind of weird to us because it it implies some sort of aversion or terror, but it is not that. It is the fear of love and reverence. It is the fear that draws us to God because he is so holy and perfect. And Peter urges us to be careful how we live because you know what kids sometimes do? Sometimes kids presume on their parents, right? Sometimes kids manipulate their parents. Peter's saying, you can't manipulate your heavenly father. You can't do it because he's just. This is part of his holiness. So be careful. Don't presume upon him, but aim to bring him joy. Now, I want to make this really clear. We cannot earn God's love. See, he loved us while we were yet sinners. He did not say, I will love you if you will obey me and be holy like I am holy. He loves us and enables us then to become holy. And when we aren't, he doesn't stop loving us. You know what he does? He disciplines us. And the Bible says, he says, like a good father, I discipline my children that I love. And in fact, in Hebrews, it even says, if you aren't being disciplined, you might not be his child because he does discipline 
the ones he loves. So I don't want you to fear, well, if I'm not holy like he's holy, he won't love me. Nope, he loves you and he will help you. And when you don't do your part, he will discipline you along the way so that you will out of his love. This is, I think, kind of a maturity issue. Some of you that are a little older, you might have the same experience. I have, my mother is here today. I will honor her by saying that the older I get, the more I realize how wise my parents were. Amen? How many of you have that experience? Uh, You know, for, for young people, you go through this phase where it's cool to rebel. Your kids will sometimes pick something that they know you won't like just because they know you won't like it, right? They go through this phase. But as we mature, I think we, we oftentimes come to a place where we begin to realize, wow, they were right all along. It's a maturity issue. So I, I think Peter would tell us, don't be conformed to those passions of your former ignorance. In a sense, saying, mature and, and turn away from those things you used to do in your rebellion and draw near to your father that is actually the one that is holy. Grow to appreciate his wisdom and his love and his holiness. And understand that just because you're his son or his daughter, it doesn't mean he won't discipline you. So conduct yourselves with fear during the time of your exile. Exile, that's an interesting. It's almost like, you know, you think about when is a young person the most tempted to stray from everything they've been taught when they leave, right? The Bible kind of says we're in a period of exile. We're living here, not in our home. Our home is in heaven. So we're living here away. And many of the parables Jesus taught were about how his people, when the father seemed to have gone away for a period of time, what would they start doing? They'd start misbehaving. They'd start mistreating one another and all of these things. So we need to understand God, number one, he's still here with us. Yes, this is our time of exile, but don't think this is a time to disobey or rebel because it's not. And God will discipline the ones that he loves. Peter, he doesn't just use in this chapter an adoption analogy. He also uses a slavery analogy. This is less uh, familiar to us because slavery is not a part of our world in a familiar way like it was to the people that would have read this letter. But Peter says that the father gave us his son as a precious payment to ransom us. A ransom, what is a ransom? That, that was the price that would have been paid to buy someone out of slavery or captivity or imprisonment so that they could be set free. So Peter says, we are set free from sin and from all of the old futile passions and and rebellions that we used to have. We're set free from those by Jesus who died for us, who shed his blood as the payment to ransom us. So you and I, we we live under this amazing miracle that, that Paul says this way in 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's exactly how Paul says what Peter is talking about. You do not belong to yourself. God bought you with the blood of his son. So what are you supposed to do? Glorify him in your body. Another way to say live as obedient children. This is very countercultural. I think we all need to, to realize just how radical this idea is that God says to us, we do not belong to ourselves. He bought us. We belong to him. And oftentimes in the Bible, the term is used that we're no longer slaves. Now we're slaves, but we're slaves to righteousness, to God. He owns us. Thank God he's good. Thank God he bought us because he loves us and has made us slaves of what is good. But this is countercultural because our culture It values nothing more than radical autonomy. That is the idol of our age. Whether it's abortion that says, my body, my rights. I don't worry about the life in me, right? That's radical autonomy. Uh, Maybe it's this, the gender ideology going around. The idea that, no, no, you tried to assign me a gender, but you don't get to do that. I'm in charge. Autonomy, radical autonomy. Sorry, we just need to recognize this. God loves every person, wants to rescue all of us from the idea that we all had that I am my own. 
That was the lie that Satan told in the garden. You can be like God if you will just disobey. God says, you can't, you know you can't, I love you anyway. I will adopt you as my child. I will reconcile you to myself. I will set you free from the slavery of radical autonomy if you'll trust in my son. And so Paul says, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You've been bought with a price, so glorify him in your body. That's what our Father has done for us. And the last thing we see uh, moving quickly through this chapter is that the Father has also given us his word of truth through which we hear once again we've been born again. Um, I'll bet many of us who, who were blessed to have our parents for a while can remember words of wisdom and truth they imparted to us, right? I can still hear stuff my dad would say. His, he had unique ways of imparting truth. He, he would impart uh, being fiscally responsible by saying, ah, good investment if I came home with something that I had spent money on that was a waste of money, right? Word, and I hear that this day. We'll look at something and think, well, I should buy that. And then I'll say, nah, good investment. No, it's not. I'm not going to do it. God, like a good father, has given us his word, his truth. He's given us his living word, the son, Jesus Christ, and his written word that is referenced here by Peter when he talks about the word of God enduring forever. You know, our physical lives, our bodies, and, and especially in First Peter, the trials that you're facing this very morning, those things, according to Peter, are like the grass that withers or the flower that fades, quickly passing. We're celebrating our son's graduation, and I cannot believe how quickly things change. This life and its trials are going to be short in the end. But the life that we have in Christ, the living word, and the truth we have in God's written word, it will endure forever. And so will we because we've received that gift of eternal life in him. And this, Peter says, is the good news that was preached to us by which we have become God's children. So brothers and sisters this morning, First of all, let me say this. There is good news if you do not know God as your father. The good news is he wants to know you as his child. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, for that express purpose that you and I could become adopted and made a part of his family. The Bible says that receiving this gift of God's grace is simply an act of faith. There is no other way to receive it. By grace, you are saved through faith. You don't earn God's love. You don't earn God's gift. You receive it by believing in the gift himself, Jesus Christ, that he was the son of God who came to give his life for us, that he shed his blood to pay the price that had to be paid for the forgiveness of our sins and to rescue us from bondage and slavery to sin so that we could become his children. If you've experienced that, the good news for us is this. God has adopted us. God is worthy of our imitating and becoming like him. We are accountable to him. And he has made all of this possible by the giving of his precious son. So let us live in obedience. And the last thing we will note because we don't want to miss that Peter mentioned very explicitly there that we love one another from a pure heart. What does it mean to be like our Father? Well, we are reminded of Jesus being asked, what is the greatest commandment? All of the law. And he said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Peter has called that living as obedient children. And Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. And Peter says, let us love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So this morning, let us ask our Father to make us like Him, and especially to love like Him. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank You today that we can call You Father. Lord, what a privilege it is. We thank You today, God, that You love us, that You chose us, that You are the one that causes us to be born again, that, Father, You call us your children, that you adopt us. And Lord, that it is very intentional. It was not an accident. But Lord, you wanted us to be your family. 
And that, Lord, you were willing to pay the price for that adoption through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that every single person that is here today will acknowledge that we have all sinned and fallen short and we have, we have alienated ourselves from you. We have treated you as our enemy by rebelling against you. Lord, this is called repentance. And Lord, together today, we confess our sin and turn away and repent. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us. And we thank you, Lord, that you gave your son to bring forgiveness of our sins, that, Lord, He paid the price on the cross for our sins, taking the punishment we deserve so that, God, we could receive the sonship that we did not deserve. And, Lord, we thank You that this gift today is received not by earning, but, Lord, through faith, that it is a gift of grace. And, Father, today, for those of us that have received this gift, we ask You to help us to learn to live as obedient children. God, to give us the desire to want to please you, to want to obey you. To God, give us the courage and wisdom to abandon the idea that Satan planted in our minds that we could be God. Or to say there is none other than our God. And he is our father and he loves us and we desire and long to please him, to be like him. Father, help us to do this. God, we can't do it on our own. We need the work of your Spirit that has been given to those of us who've been born again. So Holy Spirit, help us. And God, above all things, we pray we will remember that Jesus has reminded us over and over that the greatest of all of the commandments, the way that we most look like our Father in heaven, is by loving Him and then, Lord, loving our neighbor as ourselves no matter who that neighbor is, and especially, Lord, the ones that are the hardest to love, even our enemies, that the love that you have shown for us is most clearly seen when we love as you do. Give us the supernatural power to do this, we pray, and the grace that we need. And we ask it in Jesus' name today as, Lord, your adopted children who love you. Amen.